southern New Jersey. Welcome to Far Out Radio with Scott and Karen Teeters. I'm Scott, and today is Thursday, May the 9th, 2013. Hope you had a good day. Our friend Hannah Crum, the kombucha mama, is back with us this evening. Hannah was on the show back on the 23rd of January of this year, and you can catch that program in the archives at faroutradio.com by using the search tool at the top of the homepage. Just type in her name, Hannah Crum, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, Crum, C-R-U-M, and you'll go right to that program. Kombucha is an ancient health drink from the Far East and Northern Russia. Simply explained, it is fermented sweet tea. This wonderful beverage is easy to make and can be flavored in almost endless ways and is loaded with probiotics. You can get your healthy probiotics and a tasty drink. Because of the health benefits of kombucha, many that promote this drink, such as Hannah, are also interested in other aspects of health. Hannah shares with us today that there is no bigger threat to our overall health and well-being than the grand experiment that is being thrust upon us without our consent. And that threat is the existence of genetically modified organisms. GMOs started out as a scientific answer to solving the pesticide issue, to also to help improve crop yields. But it quickly has turned into a nightmare that raises many questions. Are these foods safe to eat, or are they very harmful in the long run? What are the environmental impacts when GMO plants cross-pollinate with non-GMO plants? Will the corporations that own the patents to the GMO plants claim that they then own the plants that will eventually cross-breed with the GMO plants? Last year, there was a referendum in California to make food companies label foods that contain GMOs. The food and big agri industry threw millions of dollars into a disinfo campaign to create enough confusion so that the referendum was narrowly rejected. Since then, laws have been passed and signed by the president that protect the makers of GMOs from any liabilities, meaning that if we get sick from eating their products, they're not responsible. No liability. That's astonishing. And remember, folks, Our elected officials, those who are supposed to be our voice in government, passed these laws. Remember that this November and thank them accordingly by not voting for them when they're running for re-election. And now the makers of GMO plants want to introduce GMO trees. Hmm. On Saturday, May the 25th, there will be a worldwide protest called the March Against Monsanto. And Hannah Crum has been following this GMO story for years and is here to talk with us about this very important issue. Hannah, are you there? Welcome back to the program. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me back. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You got your glass of booch sitting there with you? (laughs) I do. You got it. (laughs) (laughs) Always good to have a glass of booch. Especially when we're talking about something. Does the environment? Pardon me. Especially when we're talking about the environment, and not only the environment of the world around us, but the environment in our bodies. Of course, yes. today we will get out of our guts and talk about the environment around us in terms of GMOs and how they influence us. Um, you know, they have. What really scares me, and what what you know, really al- alarming to me, is the Monsanto Protection Act. That was signed into law earlier this year. It was a very um, quietly done um, on at a time when nobody was really paying attention to what was going on. But it basically says that our government can't prosecute Monsanto, um, even if uh, people end up uh, making lawsuits against them. Yeah. You know, at first, I, I remember. I don't remember when I first heard about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And at first, didn't this sound like a great solution to the pesticide use? And and they they told us that it was going to provide, you know, bigger crop yields and this would take care of, you know, feeding the burgeoning population. And, I mean, that was the story that they told us. And, uh, you know, (laughs) it all turned out to be a lie. When did this issue first get your attention, Hannah? Um, I first started paying attention to this issue when – it became, I became aware of the difference between organic and non-organic foods. And to be honest, Scott, I feel like I don't even remember when that was, maybe 10, 15 years ago or so. 
um, basically when I started, you know, purchasing food for myself and not just eating whatever was at home, it really came to mind, um, you know, what is the quality of food that I'm putting into my body? And it wasn't really until I got really into kombucha that I started following that path even farther into figuring out, well, what is, what are GMOs and what does that mean? And um, like you, I was very um, saddened to find, you know, that, that in fact what they're claiming these GMOs do isn't actually true. So they don't prevent um, crafting loss um, to insect invasion. It doesn't make higher yields. And, in fact, when you look at some of the images of how they have to treat the GMOs where they're in those suits, you know, they look like uh, space suits almost with the white, covers and they've got the, the spraying guns on there. I mean, it's kind of scary to imagine that that's how they have to take care of those plants. Um, yeah. And then you're going to consume that and put that in your body. And, you know, that to me is, is alarming, mostly because so much of this could be solved if we return to the methods with which we live in harmony with nature, right? There's, everything's a cycle. And, and in order for a cycle to work, it needs to be a closed system. And right now we have a system where um, we take things from the ground, we take nutrients from the ground to grow crops, but we're not putting back into the soil that which the crops need. Um, for instance, you know, um, night soil or um, human fertilizer has been used for a lot of time, and that was we were able to put those nutrients back into the soil. Right now we're just using chemicals, we're depleting the soil, a lot of it's ending up in runoff, and, and this is you know, so even organic foods, even something that we think is grown without pesticides, it's going to be healthier for us. Oftentimes, that isn't necessarily the case unless we're looking at what is the nutrient density of the soil. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to be mindful that not only are we feeding our bodies, but we're also putting back into the earth that which we've taken from it. Last week, we were supposed to have on a, a very interesting fellow named Buck Adams. He's from... Uh, Colorado, uh, from the, De the Denver area in Colorado, and uh, he's got an organization called uh, Vets to Farmers, and he's got a training program going where they're teaching veterans how to organically farm via hydroponics. And he's working with um, land developers in Denver to basically borrow for borrow lease, you know, for free lots that are not being used, and then they set up. Uh, greenhouses and they are they're doing vertical uh, hydroponic gardening um, as a way of feeding the local neighborhoods as well as providing uh, vets who have been having a hard time integrating back into the culture and it's a uh, it's a very heartening story you know to see what he's doing because it it, it clicks in with a lot of different issues um, it's bringing the awareness to to individuals that a lot of the things that we see in the supermarkets, um, although they, they look bright and shiny and they, they, boy, they sure last a long time sitting there on the, in the bins, you know, it's because they're designed to do that, uh, that the, this stuff, it's, uh, it's, it's not really food. I mean, you can eat it and it'll certainly fill your belly and take care of your hunger pangs, but, uh, it's empty food. I call it Franken food. You know, I tell people all the time, eat real food, you know. That's right. Yeah, well, I like that, again, because it's closing a loop, right? It's providing an opportunity to people who maybe um, don't quite fit back into a, a typical position, a typical job here, um, but also helps to bring more awareness to their community and, and benefits the whole. And, and I think that those types of systems are the ones that ultimately are going to nourish us. And I, I just want to you know, take a little issue with this concept of we're running out of food, we don't have enough food to feed the whole world, we don't have enough resources. Well, the problem with that, why we don't have that is because we're not putting resources back into the planet. In fact, you know, our planet is very regenerative, and just as our bodies are regenerative, our planet is regenerative. Well, if we don't provide what it needs in order to sustain us, then of course we're going to run out of food. But it seems to me that it's a situation being created by the GMOs as opposed to being solved by the GMOs. Mm -hmm. There's an amazing film out called King Corn, and for our listeners who have Netflix, it's available as a watch instantly. Watch this movie. It's a hoot and it's an eye opener. And one of the more subtle things about this movie is that it's it's mostly filmed in Corn Country, Iowa. 
And you think of, you see pictures of, of the cornfields in Iowa, and it just, oh, it looks so wonderful. Oh, corn, corn. Well, all that stuff is GMO corn. And uh, just about, I think like 80% of it ends up eventually being used for high fructose corn syrup. And you can't even eat this stuff. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, oh, Hannah. You have a great point. Hannah, I hear music in the background, which which I means that we have to do a little bit of a commercial thing. So we're going to take a little bit of a break here. Our guest tonight is the Kombucha Mama, Hannah Crom. And do stop by her website. It's kombuchacamp.com. That's kombucha, K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A, camp, spelled with a K, K-A-N-P. Everything you need to get started making this amazing health drink is there. Supplies, information, how-to videos, you got it. Whatever you need to make booch, Hannah's got it. We'll be right back with more Far Out Radio. Okay, and we are back, and we're talking with uh, Hannah Crum, the Kombucha Mama, is here with us tonight, talking about GMOs. Usually Hannah talks about the wonderful probiotic drink, kombucha, but since she's passionate about the pushback against GMOs, we thought we'd bring her back for a GMO conversation. But if you're looking to start making your own kombucha, it's very easy kombuchacamp.com is your one-stop shopping place for everything you need to get started. It's not expensive, it's a lot of fun, and it's very good for you. I mean, for the cost of tea bags and sugar, you can be drinking on a regular basis a very, very good drink. Anyway, okay, Hannah, um, usually when people talk about um, organic fruits and vegetables, the first knee-jerk response you hear is, oh, it's so expensive. How do you respond to that? Well, medical bills are even more expensive, and that might be um, kind of a, um, a sarcastic viewpoint, but but it's true. I mean, it, whatever you're putting into your body, your body is a filter, and so if what you're putting into your body um, isn't going to nourish it or give it what it needs, you end up putting things in your body that end up harming you and lead to disease or illness, and that's the cost of dealing with a disease or illness or waiting until enough um, accumulates in your body to create that type of a reaction, it's simply too late. Um, and so it, it's, it's important that you start now in terms of finding things. And, and there's a lot of resources out there for people who want to find this kind of food and, and maybe don't have access to it in their local area. For instance, um, you can find a farmer's market in your area. Um, nearly every state has them. And you can go to localharvest.org. And they have a whole listing of farmer's markets across the country. So that's a really great place to start because at least now you're starting to have a relationship with the people who are bringing you your food. And and when you get into that more intimate relationship with the people who are making your food, you feel more connected to your food. And Mm -hmm. you're able to see your food not simply as I'm hungry, just put whatever in my body, but as what is it I want to put into my body? How do I want to feel? How, How do I want to nourish my organism? And I think that's really important. Um, another great site that, that's fairly new um, and so probably could stand to use a little more population in terms of people using it is farmmatch.com. Um, what is that farm again? Match, farm match, F-A-R-M-M-A-T-C-H. And this is a site where you can, as an individual, even put yourself on there um, and, and locate other farmer's markets or buying clubs or really just access to um, real food, so to speak, you know, to other people who are producing real food, be they farmers or, you know, making things like sauerkraut and things like that. Um, right. So that's another great resource for people. Again, it's newer, so the more you go and use it and, and contribute to it, the, the more full the resources will be. But, uh, so, you know, what so I really that's, think is that's that... that's farmmatch.com. And what was the other one you mentioned? Sure. It was localharvest.org. And you can find a lot of great resources there for, for locating things in your neighborhood, markets mm-hmm. in your neighborhood or farmers in your neighborhood um, to start getting access to some of these better tasting foods. And the nice thing is that the farmer's market produce tends to cost less than something you might find at a Whole Food or something like that. So you're still going to potentially pay a little bit more than you would at a standard grocery store, but you'll be paying less than you would at uh, one of the higher end you know, mm-hmm. fancy organic food stores. but Plus, you're also helping people in your area with earning a living. I mean, I, I got a real 
a real beef against you know these these big box stores and you know and a big corporate model of things because when you go to a, a big box store and you buy say a cordless electric drill, the money that you that you you know gave over to them goes most of the time it goes straight to Arkansas for that place out there in Arkansas that starts with a W, and and the money leaves your community. Whereas at least if you buy that cordless uh, electric drill from the local hardware store, okay, you know, maybe it's an Ace hardware store or it's a chain store. At least it's a local guy who's running a store, he's running a little enterprise, and he's making some money. Now he's got some money, and he can go buy a pizza. And then the pizza guy can go get his car fixed. And, and then, I mean, you could spend $100 if there's $100 profit – and all you do is keep it in your community. It's the same $100, and you'll just keep going around and around and around. But as soon as you go to the big place so you can save a couple of bucks, that money is gone from your area. And when you when you go support local farmers at these uh, farmers, farmers markets or whatever, you're helping to keep your money local rather than buying your produce at a big chain grocery store. And even Whole Foods, for that matter. Help local people, and <laughs> your money will, well, you know, will all be better. I, and I think the point that you're hitting on here is that even those corporations are practicing the same type of, forgive my language, but rapacious mentality, this concept of let me get the most without paying what it's actually worth, you know, and mentioning that that, that sort of starts with a W, you know, in the way that they're like, oh, here's how you get on food stamps. And, no, we're not going to hire you full-time so you can have benefits. Right. But there's really a lack of community that those types of um, corporations bring to a community. And by making a choice, a different choice, and really dealing money not just as dollars and cents, um, but as energy. And where do you want your energy to be? Do you want to sustain those who contribute to your community, or do you do want to support those who take from your community? And I think if you're able to shift your mentality, and granted, we all have a budget, we all have, um, you know, to be mindful of our dollars and cents, but when you make those types of choices, not only do you receive a benefit on the physical level, because now you're purchasing things um, that sustain you and nourish you, but you're also, like you said, nourishing your community. You're also keeping it Again, in this kind of closed loop system where the people who live in that area are receiving the benefit as opposed to taking it away or, or what I consider kind of like a, like a broken circuit, right? A circuit doesn't generate any electricity or energy unless it's closed and touching. But if we continue to keep sending things out of that circuit, then we're, just, we're open and empty and we end up depleted. Mm-hmm. We're right up against the break here, and that music is going to start any moment, but I just want to squeeze this in. Somebody sent me an email with a long story about to demonstrate what we're talking about here, about keeping your money local. And basically the story was that a rich person came into a hotel, and he said, I'm thinking about renting all of the rooms in your hotel, but I want to look at them all first, but I'll, I'll give you a $1,000 deposit. So the, so the hotel owner took the $1,000 deposit, and he thought, oh, yeah, that guy's definitely going to you know take the whole place. So he runs out and he pays off this guy, and in, and the thousand dollars ends up paying off about about six people within a few hours. And finally, the rich man comes downstairs. He says, "This uh, this place isn't going to work for me. I want my thousand dollars back." So the guy takes the thousand dollars back. Never rented the hotel, but everybody got paid. <laughs> it's a it's a funny thing. Okay, there's our there's our music. It's time for a break. The Kombucha Mama, Hannah Crumb, is with us tonight. And stop by our website, kombuchacamp.com. That's kombucha camp, spelled with a K. Everything you need to get started making this amazing health drink is there. If you're interested in making booch, Hannah will help you out. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Far Out Radio. Hannah Crumb, the Kombucha Mama, is back with us this evening. Hannah's very passionate about the pushback against GMOs, so uh, she's here with, her, here with us tonight to talk about GMOs and good food and kombucha and all that kind of neat stuff. If you're looking to start your own kombucha, brewing your own kombucha, it's really, really easy. Kombucha Camp has uh, got everything you need. And Hannah's got a very, very neat free ebook that will explain everything you need to know about making kombucha. I discovered kombucha uh, last summer, and I did a lot of research, and I got the free ebook. And 
Yeah, everything was just spot on, and it told me exactly what to do to make kombucha. And starting last uh, August 1st, uh, we had our first batch of kombucha, and uh, we've been making it ever since. It's great. Uh, as a, just a, a general description, it has sort of the taste of um, slightly carbonated cider. And, and you can flavor it all kinds of ways, and it's really, really terrific. Anyhow, Hannah... I you know this this whole com- uh, this kombucha this whole GMO thing has really forced me you know personally to you know have another look see at the whole um, organic um, you know fruits and vegetables and you know what I'm eating and all that and I and I concluded a while ago that we can push to make sure that things are labeled so at least we have a choice. You know, when we go to the store and we, you know, we vote with our vote with our dollars. But uh, beyond that, I guess the only way to absolutely make sure that what you're eating is real food is to grow your own. I'm talking about gardening. Uh, are you a gardener? I am. I have um, I have a container That's garden. Here. I live in Los Angeles, and um, I've got several pots around, and in fact, what I grow are often herbs that I then use to flavor my kombucha, and -hmm. in this concept of closed loop, I do also, I grow some tomatoes, but then I'll take the spent tea leaves from growing my kombucha and put that in my worm bin, so now I'm putting the nitrogen back into um, feeding the worms, and then when I cultivate that dirt, that goes right back into my soil, so um, not only am I cultivating my own food where I'm not using pesticides, but I'm also re-nutrifying my soil by using the leftovers of my kombucha brewing process. So Mm -hmm. whole cultures will sometimes go in there as well, and the worms love them, and they keep the soil very healthy with lots of great bacteria living in there. So uh, worms like kombucha. (laughs) Worms like kombucha too, huh? (laughs) Yeah, they do. Well, worms and plants, uh, particularly plants that like an acid pH, like roses and things like that, really love just a little bit in um, in their soil. And so, yeah, I love doing gardening. Do you have a garden yourself, Pat? We used to grow, or I used to grow um, stuff in containers on the deck in the back, but we live in the woods, and the canopy behind us just got to be enormous. And one year I planted all kind of t- tomatoes and peppers and jalapenos and all that kind of stuff, and the plants grew, and because they're basically in the shade all day long, they never flowered. And we're not allowed to because it's a planned urban development, and you, you oh, God forbid, if you cut down a tree or trim a tree without permission, uh, you know, without direct sunlight, sunlight, uh, these things just will not flower. So, you know, I used to grow, but I don't anymore. So, sure. but that, well, what's really nice is there's a lot of new products or newer products that even folks, you know, who maybe have to bring it indoors because they've got a long winter or something like that. There's a lot of great you know, countertop gardening kits and, and things like that that are already made for you. So if you're not someone who can just pull all the supplies together, there are some easy ways to get started quickly. I got on to the square foot gardening thing about 25 years ago or so, and it's amazing how that how that methodology just tidies up your gardening efforts by putting things into these, uh, you know, square containers. I mean, uh, of course, the original square foot gardening model had these, you know, square foot, these square containers that were built, you know, attached to the ground. But really, you could do the same thing with, with any kind of container type of uh, gardening uh, environment. But it really does make your, your gardening effort a lot cleaner and easier to maintain and manage. Well, and I think you'd get higher yields with that as well because you're – you know exactly how many plants to fit in that area, and, mm-hmm. and that gives you the maximum um, yield for that particular plant because different plants need different spacing or different depths and more room for their roots. So I, I think that's a fantastic way to go. And, you know, even here in Los Angeles, we have several urban farms. I think urban farming is something that's really been picking up a lot of steam lately. In Chicago, for instance, they do the rooftop gardening, which has an added benefit of also lowering the temperature that, from the roots. So it's- yeah, still there, Hannah? Hello, Hannah. Brett, did we lose Hannah? I'm not sure if we lost Hannah. Brett, try to see if we can get Hannah back. I know she's on her cell phone. Yeah, we're talking about the the, the gardening aspect of of GMOs, and uh, 
you know, folks, the, uh, you know, the Monsanto's of the world are going to do what they do and they're going to do what they want to do. And, you know, we can push back and try to demand that we get the, at least get these foods labeled, you know, that this is a GMO product so that we can vote with our dollars and, and make a choice and make a decision. Uh, just because we don't like it, the, uh, you know, the companies that make GMO products are not going to go away. Unfortunately, they're here. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with them. Brett, do we have uh, Hannah back? Coming up this month, I'm just going to, I'm not sure if we're connected, but coming up this month on the 25th of May, there is a worldwide uh, protest against Monsanto. And it's called the March Against Monsanto. And uh, there is an effort going on in my area in Atlantic City that uh, we will be, we're helping to promote and hopefully we'll be participating in. That sounds great. Oh, yes. You, oh, you were hearing me. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I heard a busy signal and then, you know, I felt like I was talking to myself here, which sometimes I do. <laughs> and, Anyhow, uh, on the we're, we're coming up on a break here, and on the other side of the break, I want to talk about this um, this event coming up on the twenty fifth. Uh, we were talking about gardening, and uh, before we we lost you there, and there's that music. But uh, no, there's just amazing things that you, that people can do with gardening. Um, have you ever heard of a gal named Mimi Kirk? Haven't. Uh, last year, she was voted the the sexiest vegan over the age of 60. I think she's actually in her 70s. <laughs> she's really an amazing gal, but she uh, has a whole bunch of videos on YouTube, and one of them is from her backyard square foot garden, and she she went out there and she picked all the, all the veggies for a big salad and made a salad right out back from veggies that were picked fresh from the garden, and I, I watched that thing and I went, man, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> you know, I mean, food... Food doesn't get any better than that when you pick it straight off the vine. It's just loaded with all those, all those good uh, essential amino acids. Anyway, we're going to take a break here, and I think I'm going to make something to eat after we're done. Kombucha Mama is with us, and we'll be right back in just a few moments. Okay, we are back, and we're talking with Hannah Crum, the Kombucha Mama, this evening. And uh, just one more, a few more thoughts here about kombucha. If you've never had kombucha, uh, it's uh, it's gaining popularity. And if you go to a Whole Foods store, and even a lot of regular supermarkets these days, are carrying a brand called GT's Kombucha. Uh, get a bottle and give it a try. It's got kind of a cider-like flavor. Uh, it comes in a lot of different sorts of flavors because you can have a lot of fun flavoring uh, kombucha all kinds of different ways. And uh, have a couple uh, bottles and give it a try. Uh, if you if you like it, um, you go back to kombuchacamp.com. Uh, Hannah's got all the supplies there to make your own kombucha, and it's really, really easy. And the cost is just tea bags and sugar. It doesn't get much cheaper than that. And as far as the flavoring is concerned, one of the things that one of the ways that we like to make it is I like to put orange slices in the bottles after I bottle, and then it goes through a second carb uh, goes through a second fermentation. And about five days later, this stuff comes out like champagne, very very fizzy. And uh, actually, a couple times along the way, I have to burp the bottle tops uh, because the pressure builds up. But it comes out very champagne like, and it's really cool stuff. Anyhow, we're talking about GMOs and uh, good, clean food. Yeah. I, you know, I concluded a while ago that really all the all that we can do is just make uh, make choices with how we shop, and then how we cook things. And another more subtle problem with the GMOs is that just about all of the processed foods that you're going to buy is most likely made with foods that are came from GMO plants. Well, and you hit the nail on the head right there, and that's the processed foods, and um, which are not very nutritious. And while they're sexy and exciting and, and sold to you as if they're very healthy, they don't actually deliver on what, uh, on what the ads are selling you. And I think that, you know, we see that as we see obesity continues to be on the rise. We, we see that in the illnesses and the allergies and the autoimmune diseases that are continue to plague our population, and it's directly related to the food. 
And it's easy to forget that, again, because the advertisers have done a great job of manipulating your fear and putting out these really sexy, distracting images of what food should be. And that, that's con- confusing for the consumer at the end because they don't, well, do I eat organic or do I eat this or do I, you know, people get very confused by that. And I think by just simplifying and, and going to um, making the food yourself, getting away from the packaged foods is a huge step towards um, really getting back into your health again and, um, you know, not so hard on kombucha, but kombucha can certainly help. I was eating a sad diet, a standard American diet, pizza and pop and all that stuff when I first started drinking kombucha, and I my diet has shifted dramatically um, in the decade that I've been doing that. So, mm-hmm. um, it's, but I wanted to also uh, mention about the March Against Monsanto, as you were talking about. It, this is an exciting worldwide event. So GMOs aren't just a problem here in our own backyard, Absolutely but around. Not. Around the world, many countries have taken a very firm stance against them. And, in fact, it's really unfortunate that, and going back to the labeling and how do you decipher what foods are good and what aren't, is it's so inverted. The foods that are wholesome, nutritious, don't contain toxins, have to have five different labels on them for you to even know that exists, whereas the foods that are harmful and dangerous for you don't have to label that at all. And until we can put that back in the right place, like, those are the ones that should be labeled versus the ones that are healthy. Um, you know, there's going to continue to be this kind of uh, confusion about it. But that's what's so exciting about this March Against Monsanto event is it's worldwide. If you go to their website, which is um, march-against-monsanto.com, they have a whole list of um, the major cities around the world where you can participate in these types of events. And next to each city, there's a little link to a Facebook invite, and you can connect with other people in your community who feel passionate about this. And and who knows, maybe you'll also make some friends while you're participating as well. Well, Karen got on on to this uh, a week or so ago, and she contacted the gal who's running the local march in our area. It happens to be in Atlantic City, and uh, she's going to be on the program next week talk about this so you know we'll uh, you know give it give it some more air time give it a little more voice and uh we'll see what happens you know it'll be an interesting thing to to see you know i i i hope my highest hope for for this effort is that it does make a difference i remember the last time there was a worldwide protest it was back in 2002 when the bush administration was making its plans to launch a uh, preemptive war against uh, Saddam Hussein, and there were worldwide protests, and uh, President Bush got on the, on the, tel- on the uh, TV, and he said that uh, the United States of America cannot manage its foreign policy based on focus groups. And that's the way he dissed the worldwide protest by calling it a focus group. It didn't matter what people wanted. So I hope this works out well, and... Uh, you know, I mean, labeling is the key. Monsanto is not going to go away, but labeling is the key, and then people can vote with their dollars. There's the You're democracy ab- for you. <laughs> absolutely correct. And it's not just your food, but it's also your body. I mean, think about the deodorant, the shampoos, I mean, all mm-hmm. the chemicals that we're using. There's over 80,000 chemicals in consumer products that That's weren't amazing. part of our our, our environment, um, you know, a generation or two ago. And so there's a really great website um, called the Environmental Working Group. It's ewg.org, and you can go on there. They have a huge database of different beauty products, and you can you can look and see how your brand rates. If it's one that is really a high number, that means it's more toxic, whereas if it has a lower number, it's less toxic. And the nice thing about that is now you can find products that also um, have your ethos behind them as well, and that aren't going to harm you as much. And, of course, we can return back to um, using vinegar or kombucha and baking mm-hmm. soda and all of these things as our cleaning products, but the thing that's missing from those cleaning products is elbow grease. Uh, so right. it does require a little bit more effort than just spraying on a, a toxic chemical and letting it do its thing. Uh, but oh, I feel like... we want we want scrubber <laughs> bubbles. <laughs> Yeah, but the elbow grease, it'll help you build your muscles up, too. So it, it's a yeah. big win. <laughs> uh, 
Well, you have given us some very good websites of, as resources, ewg.org. You also gave us localharvest.org and farmmatch.com. These are uh, good things to know. You know, one of the other subtle, uh, more subtle things as we roll into our last two minutes here is that when you start to tune into eating organic fruits and vegetables and staying away from uh, the uh, the aisles, you know, the up and down aisles in the supermarket. Yeah, you, ha- you got to learn how to cook. <laughs> yeah, because you can't just pop it, you know, take it out of the box and take it out of the cellophane wrapper and put it in the microwave oven. You know, you got to cook something. You know, or better yet, eat stuff that's raw. I mean, raw food's just the best because all well, the essential amino acids are there in there and the essential amino acids are what your body uses on a daily basis to do repair work. <laughs> you want to get better? Eat raw food. Exactly right. And it's um it's getting back into the kitchen and letting go of the fear and letting go of the I don't have enough time. It's mm-hmm. like this is what you should have time for is right. um caring for yourself, caring for your family through the food that you're preparing and Again, this kind of mythology of advertising has, you know, told us we don't have enough time to cook and we don't have enough time to make fresh food, and that simply isn't the case. What it does is we do need to, um, you know, get back in touch with <laughs> using a, a, a cast iron pan or, or whatever that might be um, and getting away from the microwave, which which can feel scary for some people. But that's why, right. um, you know, starting very simple, keep it simple, do the basics, you know, sauteing or steaming or, you know, doing something really easy will help to build your confidence and get you back in there. And um, making that commitment to yourself, I think you end up discovering that there's so much more in terms of variety and taste and flavor than if you're just stuck eating the same box foods. Because after a while, they all start to taste like cardboard. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Or worse yet, you... You make that rice aroni, and oh man, you just can't stop eating that stuff. Yeah, that's because it's loaded with uh, natural flavorings that are stoking your appetite. Uh, yeah, the uh, it's, it's it's funny stuff. We're we're just about out of time, Hannah. Anything on the kombucha um, screen you want to mention before we go? Um, well, adding kombucha, like I said, to any diet. You mentioned GT Dave's. There's also a, a whole host of local brands that are popping up, so I always think it's fun to kind of find your local brand and connect with your local kombucha brewer. Um, yeah. Of course, not every area has one, and so GT's is a great way to get into it. Um, there's a couple other national but When you start incorporating that, you'll notice how your body will naturally want to choose better foods. And um, so I highly encourage everyone just to give it but um, yeah, we're we're excited to um, keep getting the message out there that this is good stuff, and and it'll help lead you to more information about these other things. But, so not only the environments in your gut, but the environments around your your personal community and the environments of the world. I mean, they're all dolls that are layers of the same onion, so to speak. Um, have Have you ever considered the impact that you have made just by finding? This thing called kombucha. You know, um, it's it, amazing. It, it is. It's amazing. It's a, we're growing a culture. I mean, that's what yeah. we call it. It's our culture, and so I feel like the more um, the more of us who who are on that kombucha tip, who are more into this kind of label it and and let's wake up. Let's really wake up and get out of this this rut that we're kind of being forced into. And um, you're and absolutely right, Hannah. Right. If we Hannah, come there's together, our. There's, there's our music, my friend. We gotta we gotta get going. So thanks a lot for the hour of your time. I really appreciate it. And you're always a delight to talk to. And we'll do it again another time. Alrighty? Thank you. I really appreciate uh, it. You're, you're quite you. welcome. We'll we'll talk soon. That's our program for this evening. Tomorrow night, our friend from Chicago, the voice natural direct Joe Hu will be with us and we'll be taking your calls. Joe would love to talk to you. Thanks for being with us on Far Out Radio, and uh, stop by the website, faroutradio.com, and take advantage of all our cool features. Take care. We'll be back tomorrow night.